We want to remember what has transformed our lives. Not only for here, but for eternity. That is that day that Christ, your own son, died on the cross. Demonstration of your love for the whole world. And because of that, you can be able to say today, Abba Father. We pray as we take this time to commemorate that you'll speak to our hearts. I will not take this like any other thing. But indeed a life transforming event. We ask that you take over this time. Make this time indeed a blessing to all of us. In Jesus' name. Amen. As you prepare to partake of the Holy Communion, remember this is not a time to run away from Holy Communion, but it's time to run to Christ. The blood that is shed on the cross is powerful to cleanse our past sins, present sins, and future sins was over once and for all. So go to, the Lord, go to the Lord as you prepare your heart. Ask for forgiveness so that there will be nothing that hinders you as you partake of the Holy Communion. The bread as well as the drink. So on top, the first layer is the bread and the second layer will be the drink that represents the blood of Christ.
But I'll ask uh, Brother Nasiri to lead us in prayer as to pray for the body of Christ. And let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you today, and we thank you for the sacrifice of Christ Jesus on the cross for all of us. Thank you for the body that was slain for our sins. Thank you for the healing of every disease in our bodies. Thank you for the forgiveness of sins. Thank you for the restoration of everything in us. And we thank you for the lamb that was crucified on that day. Thank you, Lord Jesus. As we share in your body today, we pray that you receive us in your presence, forgive us our sins, and you accept us as your children today. As we remember this King of glory, we ask that you, Holy Spirit, be with us here today. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. The Apostle Paul, inspired and carried by the Holy Spirit, and brought these words. For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Let us all partake of the bread. The last Reverend Cachilius to lead us in prayer. The blood of Christ. Let us pray. Father, Lord, indeed, we come before you. We submit ourselves before you as we prepare our hearts to partake of this blood, which we are aware you shed it in the cross on behalf of us so that we can be forgiven and be redeemed back. And this is a command you gave us that we need to be partaking and fellowshipping with other believers as we are preparing now so that we can remember the suffering and the love you gave for us. Lord Jesus, I want to pray that as we prepare to partake of this, it is not like, it is not like a ceremony, it is not like something we do it for granted, but we are remembering how you suffer because of our sins. How I pray that you be with us as we fellowship, as we take this blood which you shed in the cross because of us. Lord Jesus, I want to pray, trusting and believing. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. Let us all partake of the blood of Christ. blood of Jesus all the blood
I encourage you, whatever you might be holding in your hand right now, to set it down for just a moment. As we begin to give the Lord a praise offering in the house, can you give the Lord a praise offering in the house? Can you praise the Lord in the house, church? Give the Lord a praise offering for He is worthy. He's worthy. Yes, He is. He's worthy. Bless Him one more time. Hallelujah. Oh, hallelujah. We thank you for the blood. We thank you for the body of Christ. And we praise you this morning. Father, we want to come before you this morning with our offerings. They will never compare to what you gave to us on the cross. They will never compare to the new mercies every morning. They will never compare to your sufficient grace for each day. Say amen, church. Oh, the blessings on the cross and the daily blessings by the Holy Spirit, the grace and the mercy. We thank God. Amen, church. We bless the Lord. Amen, church. And now is our chance to give back something. Something. It all belongs to Him anyway. If you're able to lift your hands in the house of God, it's because He made you able to lift your hands. If you're able to lift a shout of praise in the house of God, it's because He made it possible for you to lift up your voice. If you're able to give an offering today, in these baskets that are in the front of the sanctuary or online by texting or going to the website or the cash app whatever it is hallelujah our mind is to build the kingdom of God and not our own kingdom somebody say amen so today we come into this place and we have a chance an opportunity to give back just a little bit of something that he has given to us in abundance so please prepare your heart now prepare your heart and ask the father what is my sacrifice of praise what is my sacrifice of worship what is my sacrifice financially the altar is open the giving is open you're welcome church prepare your hearts as we worship the Lord and then as you feel led go ahead and begin to give your offerings to our Father in heaven, who is worthy, who is worthy, he's worthy, he's worthy.
of God. He's worthy, church. Bless him one more time, for he is worthy, church. Hallelujah. Amen. Come, let us adore him, Christ the Lord. Amen. Give the Lord a hand. Amen. You may be seated. Amen. Thank you, Brother AJ. One of the things that you cannot get when you stay home worshiping is be able to partake of the Holy Communion. It's one of the privileges of uh, coming to church. Uh, unfortunately, the youth just left, but that's okay. Uh, we will send... Uh, uh, I mentioned last time that one of the things I learned when I went to the Costco uh, Good News uh, Mission in New York is the beauty of watching the young people dancing for the Lord. And I yearn to have that happen here. And wasn't sure exactly how that can happen because... You have to have a professional dancer, which is actually called righteous dance. But as the Lord would have it, because he knows how to do it than us, he has provided for us someone who is able to do that. So in our midst today, we have Bejam Sujit and Manokna Sujit from India. If they can stand. Uh, I welcome you to come forward here. And uh, we had a, a meeting uh, on Friday. Uh, we had met, they came last Sunday, and we had a meeting on Sunday, I mean uh, on Friday. And Sujit, is a professional dancer. And uh, Bejam Sujit is a professional admirer of the dance. <laughs> uh, so, I don't know whether we did. Were, you, were we able to get a clip? Okay, they were not able, but uh, let me let uh, uh, Manokna tell us about this because she's come a long way with this thing, and uh, it's good to have her here. Hello, everyone. And I'm really glad that I'm here and being part of this wonderful community and uh, the church here. And uh, it's been uh, my really great pleasure that uh, Pastor and I were able to connect this Friday. And uh, we were able to uh, come up with this dance. And uh, I was really looking forward to participate and uh, introduce myself to all the young children. And um, one thing I want to say is that uh, whatever I do, it's all because of God's grace, and uh, I give thanks only to Him. Uh, even uh, this all talent or anything that God has provided us, it is useful for His purpose. It is really happy. Uh, I'm really happy for that. Uh, that's all I want to share, and uh, I'm looking forward to meet everyone. Thank you, Pastor. Amen. And... Um... So we'll have somebody take, uh, take uh, Manokna to the youths so she can show them. And uh, so Nasir is here who will uh, lead her to see the youths. And uh, we're looking forward to this. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Amen. Give the Lord a hand. Yeah. Amen. 
Amen. What a blessing. God knows how to take care of his job. Uh, he knows when we need it. He knows the talents that are needed and he provides at the right time. You've heard me say, never think you are indispensable when it comes to the work of God. Because he knows when his work needs somebody to, to do it. And so all of a sudden we needed someone and the Lord provided miraculously as he himself can do. Now, last Sunday I mentioned that, that we had uh, two people who had uh, committed to help to buy the two, com- that we needed three computers and two people have committed to buy uh, two of them. Uh, except that the second person, I think she had problems sending the money. So whoever that is, uh, uh, please uh, see, see me, see Kipchilis or Nazir, so they can show you how you can uh, donate that money, $2,000. We still need one more. So if you are here and the Lord is touching you, uh, so we can buy another computer. We need three of them at the back there to be able to run uh, the internet and uh, all the things that we do at the back there. So uh, if the Lord touches you, you want to bless the kingdom of God, please, uh, you can donate. And I also mentioned if you want to do half-half or whichever, how much you want to give, just send cash up and just indicate computer. Amen? Amen. Let us uh, have a video uh, to play. Section one of one time finals. The boys one mile race walk sponsored by Tracy Sunlin. Hip number one is Nolan Allen. Arlington, Massachusetts is Spencer Dunn, Auburn, Maine. Hip six is Alex Peters, National Cameron Hawk, Yellow Springs, Ohio. Hip 11. 21-6. For the top this year. Here comes your winner. He led from the gun, Anthony Peters. Here's his twin. How many of you participated in this kind of competition? Raise your hand up. Now, that is one competition I never could get it. Every time they would pull me out and say, you are running. But my wife was best on this. I just learned that she was really, really good at it. I could never get the rules down. Every time I do it, they say, you are running. And I was embarrassing, or at least <laughs> to watch when they are pulling people out. Those are judges, they stand there and say, pull you out. Another one is pull out. And they say, you are not walking according to the rules. Now, today, I want to talk about the rewards in heaven. But what is interesting about the rewards that will be given in heaven, that not everyone will get the rewards. Now, the Bible says that these rewards will be given according to what you and I have done. But some works will not make it. In the passage you are going to read, it's going to be telling us that some works will be burned. And when the works are burned, that means whoever performs those deeds will get nothing because the works will be burned. And so today, my message is how to make sure that your works 
will not be burned up. How to make sure that your works will not be burned up? Now, rewards in heaven, in heaven is addressed in scripture everywhere. In Matthew chapter 16, verse 27, Christ said, For the Son of Man is going to come in his Father's glory with his angels, and then he will reward each person according to what they have done. In Revelation, in a vision to John, the Lord says, Look, I am coming soon. My reward is with me, and I will give to each person according to what they have done. And now here is a passage that tells us that some people will lose the rewards because their works will be burned. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 13 through 15, and it reads, By the grace God has given me, Paul says, I laid a foundation as a wise builder, and someone else is building on it. But each one should build with care. For no one can lay any foundation other than the one already laid, which is Jesus Christ. For no one can lay any foundation other than the one already laid, which is who? Jesus Christ. Verse 12. If anyone builds on this foundation using gold, Silver, costly stones, wood, hay, or straw. Their work will be shown for what it is. Because the day will bring it to light. It will reveal with fire. No, it will be revealed with fire. And the fire will test the quality of each person. Let me read that again. It will be revealed with fire. And the fire will test the quality of each person's work. So your work will be tested to see whether it qualifies for rewards. If what has been built survives, the builder will receive the reward. If it is burned up, the builder will suffer loss, but yet will be safe. Even though only as one escaping through the flames. Let me stop here to say, this was the most scary passage I ever read in my life. I still remember very well, I was 18 years old. I had attended a camp. And these students from the Bible college, man and a lady, were teaching in this passage. And they say there are people who will get to heaven, but all their works will be burned. And they will be saved, because they were saved anyhow, but as though they have come through the fire. And I could imagine myself going through the fire and everything else is burned. And I was like, this is the most scary message I've ever heard. It's not too long ago, about two, three years ago, I met those two. And I said, you guys, you preach a message when I was 18 years old. I still remember to this day. In fact, I still remember where I was sitting, partly because there was a lady across that was trying to get my attention. And yet, I was paying attention to a very serious message. Never forgot it. And guess what? The following year, I got into work. I started teaching Sunday school because of this passage. I said, I want to build my works and do it right. Now, our works will be tested by fire. If your works does not pass the test, they will be burned up. But you will be saved even though as only one escaping through the flames. Now, 
Good works will not get you into heaven. Good works does not count for your salvation, but it only matters as evidence of your faith. As James 2.17 says, faith without works is death. Before salvation, works does not count. Because we are saved by grace alone through faith in Christ Jesus. But after you are saved, good works matters. It is called bearing fruits. So again, if your works are burned up, then you will not get any reward. Listen to what Paul says again. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 10. He says, For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, so that each of us may receive what is due for the things done while in the body, whether good or bad. Now, this is not the judgment to decide whether you will qualify to go to heaven. This is what is called the bima seat. The Greek word here is bima, the bima seat. Now, the word was taken from its, its main games where the contestants would compete for the prize under the careful scrutiny of judges who would make sure that every rule of the contest was obeyed. The victor of the event who participated according to the rules was led to the judge to stand in the platform of the bima, stand on the bima. There he would be given the medal because he has won and he did it according to the rules. So the bima seat or the judgment seat of Christ is not to decide whether you will you qualify to go to heaven, but it is to decide whether your works qualifies for a reward. There is what is called the white throne of Christ. That is what will decide those who go to heaven. It will be actually the judgment seat for those who have not believed in Christ Jesus. But this one is the be massive. Second Timothy 2 5 reads, also if anyone competes as an athlete, he will not be crowned as the winner unless he competes according to the rules. Because every rule of this contest must be followed. So here are three things that you must do if you want to secure your work so that your works will not be burned. First, be faithful in whatever you do in serving the law. Be faithful. What does it mean to be faithful in serving the law? Be reliable. Someone who others can count on, ever present to fulfill the assignment. Someone who does not need to be followed up. Reliable. Whatever you do, you do it wholeheartedly. Colossians chapter 3, verse 23 through 24 reads, Whatever you do, Walk at it with all your heart as walking for the Lord, not for your human masters, since you know that you will receive an inheritance from the Lord as a reward. It is the Lord Christ you are serving. Anyone who does wrong will be repaid for the wrongs. There is no partiality. So, first, faithfulness means that you are reliable. Second, it means that you work wholeheartedly. You give it all. And third, faithfulness means that you can be trusted with few things. Luke chapter 16, verse 10 says, He who is faithful in what is least 
is faithful also in much. He who is unjust in what is least is unjust also in much. That means no matter what you are doing in church, if it is cleaning, if it is cleaning the toilets, or whatever you are doing, faithfulness. You are faithful in doing just that. You are not taking for granted as say, because it's not a big job, I don't have to give it all. We are expected to give it all. Faithful also means that you are faithful to your calling. You are doing, you are faithfully doing what God has called you to do. Acts chapter 20, verse 24, Paul says, But none of these things move me, nor do I count my life dear to myself, so that I may finish my race with joy. And the ministry which I received from the Lord Jesus to testify the gospel of the grace of God. Paul is saying the persecutions could not hinder him. He said he would not even consider his body. He was willing to die doing, fulfilling his calling. In fact, in the end, when he was about to die, he wrote this to Timothy in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 7 through 8. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Finally, there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give to me on that day. And not to me only, but also to all who loved his appearing. Paul said, I have finished the race. What did he finish? He finished his assignment. He was faithful to his calling to the end. In fact, if you read the previous verse, verse 6, Paul is saying, I am being poured out. I am about to die. And then he said, but I have finished the race. Faithfulness means that you are faithful to your calling. You are doing the assignment that God has given you. Faithfulness also means that you are faithful to what God has given to you. Let me read this passage. 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 2. It reads, Let a man so consider us as servants of Christ and stewards of the mysteries of God. Moreover, it is required in stewards that one be faithful. What is Paul talking about? They were given to be stewards of the mysteries. To talk about the gospel, to talk about the church. He said, we are stewards of this. And what is required of us is to be faithful in proclaiming the gospel. We are required to be faithful. So let me ask you this morning, what has God given to you? What kind of talent has God given to you? And are you faithful using that talent? If you are a singer, are you faithful Using that talent. What talent has God given to you? We had Manokna. She's excited. To be able to use the talent. That God has given to her. You know there are three things that are true for every believer. That God has given you a preordained assignment. According to Ephesians 2.10, we are God's workmanship, created for good works, which were created before the foundation of the earth. You and I have been given a preordained assignment. Secondly, God has given you a talent. That talent is to enable you to fulfill this assignment. It is an empowerment. God did not just give you assignment. He also empowered you. Third, in some way or another, when you look back to your life, 
God has prepared you for this service. God has prepared you. So are you using the experience? Are you using the talent? God has equipped you. Are you faithful to that? Some of us have been given the talent to make money. Or God has given you a talent whereby you work and you make a lot of money. But the question is, are you using the money God is giving you to build this kingdom? Are you? I have some American friends who make a lot of money. And they tell me, God has given us this gift and all we are looking for is where to invest. Where to invest? In the kingdom. But you know, one of them, we went to Kenya in March. We went to Kibera. When we came back, that following week, he contributed over 90,000 US dollars to the back end ministry for Gibera. He said, God has given me. And then the following week, he also spent 20,000 to put up a webinar, which was attended by over 500 people. And he gave each person $50 just to attend, $50 Amazon gift, just to attend the webinar so that he can tell them about Kibera. How many of us here today can say, I am using what God has given me to invest in the kingdom of God, to build the kingdom of God? Unfortunately, some of us Africans were very selfish. When it comes to the work of God, we're very selfish. We want to get and get and get and get and get. Guess what? Stop asking God to promote you. Stop asking God to give you more money. He is not going to give you because you are not using it for the kingdom. Stop asking for promotions. If you are not using it for the kingdom, God is going to take it and give it to someone else. And you are going to remain there. He will either take it away or keep you there. And you keep saying, I want to be promoted. You know, I walked through in, I walk in different churches before I came to America. And there were people who actually were blessed, but they were not giving money to God. And I used to say exactly this. I say, be careful, God will take it away and give it to someone else. Guess what? Today, some of those people who are not giving have nothing. It's been taken away. Don't be one of them. Invest. The reason why God has given you is so you can use it for his kingdom. And the more you give him, the more he gives more because you are, you are a faithful steward. He will make sure that you don't miss it because he knows that his kingdom is being, is being built. One of our kids was asking us about our money and we told her, my wife told her what we give to the church and what we do to support pastors. I was like, that's a lot of money. So well, God gave it to her so that we can be a blessing to the church and a blessing to the work of God. Actually protesting, you guys are spending a lot of money in the ministry. I said, well, this is what, why God gives us. We are spending it for the kingdom. We're being faithful to what God has given us. Now, some people are, are still even struggling to give their tithes alone. So let alone giving beyond the tithes, but they're still struggling about tithes, giving the tithes. Be faithful. That is what is required. Be faithful. Now, another aspect of faithfulness is being loyal. Not moving from one child to another one, from one child to another one. There's no loyalty there. 
being loyal. Proverbs chapter 20 verse 6 says, Many will say they are loyal friends, but who can find one who is truly reliable? God also is asking, are you reliable? He says, are you loyal to him? See, Job, in spite of what he went through, he remained loyal to God. No matter what his friend says, he remained loyal to God. Are you loyal to God? And sometimes when you go through challenges and things are not going well, we complain to God. But God wants us to be loyal. Say, God is good. God is faithful. He knows what he's doing. So the first requirement is be faithful in whatever you are doing for the Lord. Be faithful. No matter what happens, be faithful. Most of us pastors during the pandemic, what kept us is faithfulness. Can you imagine preaching to empty seats and believing that somebody out there in the house is watching for you instead of watching football? And we had our faith, we had to be stretched. I mean, we had to believe you all that you are watching really. And you are excited. We had to really psych up ourselves every Sunday. There are times we had to preach on Saturday so that it can be uploaded on Sunday. Now imagine preaching on Saturday. I was telling the guys, I said, you guys realize this is a, you're dis- I mean, we're disoriented. You bring the pastor on Saturday to preach and preaching to empty seats. I mean, it was tough. But we had to be faithful to our calling. We had to be faithful proclaiming the word. That's what kept us. And we have to be faithful. You know Jeremiah, the prophet Jeremiah, the weeping prophet? You know what is unique about Jeremiah's ministry? Nobody repented. I believe 40 years, no one repented. But he was faithful. He kept preaching and preaching and preaching. But God told him at the beginning, he said, they will not listen to you. But just be faithful. He did it all those years. At some point, they even put him under the, on, the, on the well to try to kill him. But he was faithful. Because he knew one thing. I have been called to be faithful. So as our job is to be faithful, to proclaim the message, to say that which God has asked us to do, to proclaim to you. Once we are done here, it is upon you and God. Now, all of us, our goal should be this. We all want to receive this commendation. Matthew chapter 25, verse 2. His Lord said to him, Well done, good and faithful servant. You are faithful of a few things. I will make you ruler over many things. Enter the joy of your Lord. That is what we all want. When we get to heaven, that the Lord will say Welcome, my good and faithful servant. That you, you are faithful. So the first requirements that you need to make sure you are doing is be faithful in everything that you are doing for the Lord. Second, fulfill God's will for your life. I mentioned that each one of us has been given a preordained assignment. So fulfill that assignment. Matthew chapter 7, verse 7 through uh, 21 through 23 reads, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name, and in your name drive out demons, and in your name perform miracles? Doing God's will. Doing that which God has called you to do. Know the story of Jacob. When he was told to get out of his angles uh, place, to go back to Bethel, he went and stopped 30 miles short. He stopped in Shechem, 
instead of going another 30 miles to make it to Bethel. And for 10 years, the Lord never appeared to him. And when he got in trouble, the Lord spoke to him and said, go to Bethel and build an altar for me. And then he remembered when God appeared to him in the same place, Bethel. So he went, he built the altar. The Bible tells us after he had built, the Lord appeared to him and blessed him. Why didn't God appear to him for 10 years? Because he was outside of God's will. He was living in a wrong geographical location. He was just 30 miles away. Just like here to Arlington. 30 miles away. So what does it mean to do God's will? It means doing what God has called you to do in this life. Doing what God has called you to do at the right time and in the right geographical location. God is particular. You have to be at the right place at the right time. It also means you are persistently doing it no matter what challenges you may face. It means that you are not abandoning God's work in order to do something else that is more lucrative financially or it's more prestigious. It's more prestige. So again, what has God called you to do? What talents has God given to you? And is that what you are doing right now? And if you are not doing, what are you waiting for? So the first point is, be faithful in whatever you do for the kingdom of God. Secondly, fulfill God's will for your life here on earth. And then lastly, whatever you do, do it all for the glory of God. Whatever you do, do it all for the glory of God. First Corinthians chapter 10, verse 31 says, So whether you eat or drink, or whatever you do, do it all for the glory of God. Now, why is that important? Because motives will be revealed on that day. Motives of why you did what you did will be revealed. It's First Corinthians chapter 4, verse it reads, therefore, judge nothing before the appointed time. Wait until the Lord comes. He will bring to light what is hidden in darkness and will expose the motives of the heart. At that time, each will receive their praise from God. Your motive for serving the Lord will be examined. In other words, are you serving the Lord to please your parents? Are you serving the Lord to please your pastor? Are you serving the Lord because you want to gain a good name in the community? When you give, are you giving for people to see that you are generous? What are your motives for doing what you are doing for the Lord? I might be wondering, what's pastor talking about motives? Well, not too long. A pastor spoke to a group of people. And I got the report that it was really powerful. They were very happy. So I, I called this pastor and I said, you did a good job, thank God. You know what he told me? I know what the people want. And so I tell them what they want to hear. I know what the people want, and so I tell them what they want to hear. That is very sad. That means he did not go there to tell them what God wanted him to tell them. He went there to tell them what he believes that they need to hear. That's a shame. 
We are the mouthpiece of God. And we are supposed to tell people what God tells us to say. But not what makes people happy. Not what makes people excited. It is what God has told us to do. That's a shame. And that's exactly what many preachers are doing nowadays. They know you want to get rich, so they come and tell you how you can get rich. Plant a seed, do this, do this. Bless a minister of God so that you can get rich. They know what you want, and they come and tell you that. They are not after your soul. They are after your pocket. Motives will be examined. Now one time in this sanctuary right here, a pastor preached a message. I was in camp, on the campus, but I, I think I was speaking to the youth or so speaking to the uh, Sunday school. Somebody came and told me and said, this is what happened. This is what the pastor preached about. And it was out of character. So I confronted him at the office. I said, why did you preach that kind of a message? I said, was that for the church? Was that helping believers? Was it building the church? He said, no. So it was about me. This pastor had made a mistake. He was supposed to apologize. And instead, he rebuked the members. He beat them, their heads. Instead of apologizing for what he had done. I had to confront him. And he said he did it for himself. Not for God. Not for the church. And I said, I guess we are not on the same side of the battlefield. I guess we are not on the same side of the battlefield. I am fighting for him. It doesn't look like you are fighting for him. I am fighting for the church. It doesn't look like you are fighting for the church. It's amazing. You know, I've had a lot of associates, and I have had some characters. So if the pastors can do, how much so believers? It's a, it's a bad thing that we're doing things because of what we want. I don't preach because I want to preach. I don't preach because I know what to preach. I don't prepare because I know I want to prepare. I only prepare what the Lord has given me to preach. I have learned it's the best way to preach. I had not planned to preach this message. I had another message that I prepared from Monday. The Lord on Friday morning gave me this message, and I obeyed him. Watch your motives, because God will examine your motives. So three things. Be faithful in whatever you are doing for the kingdom. Be counted on. Don't let the work of God suffer. If you have committed yourself to be in a particular ministry, do not let God's work suffer. Be faithful. Do his will. What does he call you? If it is preaching, preach. If it is singing, sing. I see a lot of people switching from singing to preaching to pastors. Or, I mean, it's admirable, but I, but I wonder whether are they actually following God's will or they are doing what everyone else is doing. Do what God has called you to do. When I graduated at the Bible college, I was asked to work in the translation office. 
And this lady from Australia, missionary, we were friends. And she wanted me to work in the translation office. But I refused. And she was so mad. And you know why I refused? That's not my talent. I cannot sit in the office the whole day, writing, writing, writing. No way. I'm called to preach. I need to be with people. You're killing me. If you put me in the office, you're killing me. I have to be where I can preach, where I can encourage believers. So I refuse. Do what God has called you. Not what anyone is calling you. So I conclude this message. Rewards should motivate you. Rewards in heaven should motivate you. It should be a motivation to serve the Lord faithful. It should be a motivation to make sure that you are busy doing something for the kingdom. Because when you get there, there will be rewards. But it will be based on what you have done. Just make sure it will not be burned out. My desire, and I hope that is your desire, is that on that day, when you get to heaven, that God will say, well done, my good and faithful servant. Let us all stand. Maybe you are there and you are saying, Pastor, I don't even know what God has called me to do. But you are not alone. There are people who do not know. As of yet, they have not discovered what God has called them to do. So if you are there today and you are saying, Pastor, pray for me. Because I am yet to discover what God has called me to do. Then raise your hand, and then I will pray for you. You are saying, God has not showed me yet. Then you need to labor in prayer and say, Lord, show me what is it that you want me to do. Thank you. Anyone else who says, pray for me, Pastor. I do not know exactly what God wants me to do. Or you have not discovered that talent or that assignment that God has given you. Anyone else? Thank you. Anyone here who is saying, I know my talent. I know what God has given me. I just need to get to work. Raise your hand. I will pray for you too. Now, who knows exactly what God has given him to do? Thank you. Anyone else? Thank you. Anyone else? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Father, we want to pray this time. Lord, thank you for those who already know their calling in this life. They've already discovered that which you have called them to do here on earth. Lord, I pray that you will empower them, that you will encourage them, that you will guide them, and give them the courage and the confidence to go into that which you have called them to do, to begin and to trust you. Like Jeremiah who was young, a young boy. And yet he trusted you and proclaimed the message. I also want to pray for those who are saying here today, Lord, I do not know. I have not discovered the assignment that you have given me here on earth. Lord, I pray for each one of them. That Lord, you will reveal to them 
that which you have called them to do. Make it clear. Send someone. Reveal to them in scripture. Whichever way you can do it, oh God. Let them know their assignment here on earth. And for those who are already active in the church, doing something, I pray for strength. I pray for confidence. I pray, Father, that you will encourage them if there is any discouragement they are going through to be faithful like Paul who said, no matter what happens, I will continue fulfilling the assignment. Lord, I thank you for this moment and I give you all the glory because of what you have done. We want to thank you for Bejam Sujit and Manokna Sujit. Thank you for their willingness to serve the young people at this church, to teach them the righteous dance. We pray that you use them for your own glory. May that ministry flourish as these youngsters are changed and transformed in doing that which glorifies your name. We thank you and give you all the glory. For we ask all this in the name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And all the saints say, Amen. Amen. Thank you so much. Thank you for coming uh, to worship with us. Those of you who are watching on the internet, uh, Facebook or YouTube, thank you so much for taking time uh, to be with us. Uh, for visitors, uh, we have Chai and Mandasi. If you are not a Kenyan, we will show you what Mandasi is. But if you are a Kenyan, welcome to Kenyan Tea. Amen. Thank you, our friends. I would love to see you all the time. You come to visit us. Thank you so much. Karibuni. Tutakunyo chai pamocha. Amen. Let us pray as I dismiss you with a blessing. Father, thank you again for our guests. We are so grateful that uh, they've come to worship with us. We pray that you go with them and bless them. We thank you for those who are watching on the internet, YouTube. Thank you for their time. We pray that they have been blessed. And as they go to their activities for the remainder of the day, may you bless them. For those who are going to bed, those who are watching in other countries, we pray that you give them a good night. And now, may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. May we all be dismissed with the peace of the Lord and all the saints saying, Amen. Amen. Asante.